All right, so it is now recording. Okay, thanks everybody. So thank you all for being here with us. Uh, Reemploy Connecticut is something that we are just uh, thrilled to finally launch. Um, and I say finally because this is an effort that the Department of Labor has been engaged in um, as a variety of initiatives since 1988. Um, so there have been attempts to modernize our system going back that far. Uh, they've been named attempts, but for one reason or another, um, they they were stalled. And so uh, back in, in 2013, we picked it up again and uh, have been part of this consortium that is allowing us to, to launch to reemploy Connecticut. Um, we're looking at July 5th, and we're super excited because it's going to make it so much more of a, a user-friendly system for claimants, for employers, for TPAs. Um, and so, you know, we are thrilled to be doing this. It, it is something that we have all been kind of living, breathing, eating, sleeping for a very long time. And so we appreciate you taking the time out of your day um, to, to see this presentation and to have an opportunity to ask questions. We, we wanna make this system more user-friendly for you. And so, um, you know, with that, I will, will uh, give it over to Daryl Dodinsky, the deputy commissioner, um, and then we'll get right to starting the presentation. Thank you, commissioner. Um, yeah, it's great to be here by one of a few town hall meetings this week and just moving forward. Reemploy Connecticut is ready. We're going to be going live, as the commissioner stated, July 5th, and we're going to have um, support throughout. Um, but without further ado, let's turn it over to Henry Pianco. He's our subject matter expert with Reemploy Connecticut uh, and our tax division. And with great support rep representation, uh, we'll hear from Henry. So thank you, Henry. Okay, great. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, so yes, my name is Henry Piankos. I'm currently assigned to the department's modernization project as the tax division lead. I was previously uh, the supervisor of the employer tax accounting unit. So uh, basically, I, I have a real good uh, understanding of the challenges you and your clients are facing uh, and what you've experienced in the past with our old system. Um, I worked with uh, Steve Boucher and Clay Wilson. You might recognize those names. They're still there in the employer tax accounting unit uh, working on the first quarter filings as we speak. So uh, I, you know, I do have a, some firsthand knowledge of, uh, of what you folks have been going through. Uh, Will, I'm all set for slide one, please. All right, I will. And we are good. Ooh. Great, thank you. So CTDOL, the Connecticut Department of Labor, we're working very hard to get this relaunch going. Uh, th this launch rather, uh, it, and it's uh, the reemploy CT system. It's actually uh, a system that uh, spans over three different divisions of the Department of Labor, the tax division, benefits division, and the uh, appeals division. Um, as has been stated already, you know how long we've been working on this, then the pandemic threw us for another, uh, you know, threw us for a loop there, and we are ready to go on July 5th. Uh, the reemploy CT system, it changes a lot about how the way we'll do business. Uh, it changes it for unemployment filers, it changes it for employers, and it changes uh, for their third party, the employer's third party agents, such as yourselves. Uh, and just to shorten things up, I'll be referring to, to you folks as TPAs pretty much for the rest of this presentation. Um, we're here today to give you an overview of those changes and to help you prepare. When July 5th arrives, uh, by the time July 5th arrives, you'll have seen advanced copies of the new screens, um, and you should be able to hopefully transition without too much pain. Uh, ultimately, this is a great system. Um, it's going to bring us online uh, and improve upon the old 70s COBOL system that's <laughs> right now is kind of being held to uh, together with duct tape and clothespins. So it's a big improvement. Uh, but we recognize it is a change. So we're here to answer your questions, uh, to help clarify any issues, and hopefully do all that before, uh, before these issues come up. Uh, we'll hold another session in late June to kind of round up any uh, last minute questions. We'll also continue to put out information uh, and resources on our website. And we'll also be notifying you folks who sign up for our email with, uh, with email updates. Um, once we get past July 5th, 
beyond our go live date, we'll, we'll, you'll still be able to get in touch with us by email and by phone. And we'll continue to update the frequently asked questions on our webpage with, uh, with information as needed. Uh, Will, ready for slide two, please. So basically, uh, this is this is geared towards TPA. So what is a TPA? Uh, when when we're discussing it here, it's any entity that files and or pays unemployment taxes on behalf of another employer. Um, and uh, let's see, and should register. You folks will need to register in the new reemployee CT system in July as a TPA. Um, the TPAs can include anyone who's filing local, regional, uh, who, who, anyone who is a local, regional, or national payroll agency, uh, any CPAs or bookkeepers who are filing for multiple entities uh, or for multiple employers, as well as corporate payroll departments uh, filing for their subsidiaries. Uh, by registering as a TPA, you'll be able to work on any employer linked to your TPA credentials. And I'll speak more about what that means, the linking part. Uh, a, a little further down in the presentation. Uh, but importantly, I'd like you to, uh, to be aware that you don't need to be linked to an employer's account to one of your client's account to file and pay on unemployment taxes on their behalf. Uh, you'll be able to do that immediately after you register. Uh, okay, Will, I'm ready to go to slide three. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, slide three, this is kind of, uh, I consider this a little bit of a table of contents, kind of to give you an idea of what will be coming up in the, the following slides after this. Um, and just briefly, uh, we'll be talking about TPAs needing new credentials. Uh, this is a very straightforward process that you'll be able to do uh, uh, July 5th or later. It's only gonna take you a few minutes. Uh, that's plenty of time before the July 31st due dates. So, uh, just want to bring that to your attention. And another thing, your FEIN, your Federal Employer Identification Number, is going to be a key to this process. That's kind of what uh, really shows us who the TPA is on our on our uh, database tables. Um, and we'll be providing sneak peeks of those sign-on screens uh, in the very near future. Um, number two, there's also a, a new tax a wage bulk file format. We'll be sharing that with you. Uh, actually, we've already shared that with you. I think we did that back in uh, January. We first published it uh, on our website. Uh, one thing I just want to mention here that our seven-digit employer registration numbers are becoming 10-digit employer account numbers. That's how they're referred to in the new system with the new jargon. Um, anybody, any employer who has a current number, uh, you'll just need to add three trailing zeros to their current number. Um, also, we'll be talking about the, the various payment methods, the ACH credit format, and uh, which has some changes. Um, and we've published those already. And the be some changes to the ACH debit process, which I'll be going over. Um, Reemployee CT, it's all digital. Uh, so we're finally giving employers and TPAs a way to electronically send in correction returns. So we'll no longer be uh, uh, accepting paper returns. And uh, there'll be three different electronic self-service methods that I'll be discussing uh, regarding how to do those corrections. And then finally, uh, TPAs, uh, we we strongly urge you to use the rate exchange process we have now. Um, it's a batch job that runs every day at 3.30. It picks up your file and it compares it to our database and tells you what the correct rates are for your clients. Uh, in one kickback file, in another file that it's generated, it tells you which account numbers do not match and don't exist in our database. So uh, we encourage you to take, uh, take full advantage of that. That uh, opportunity will continue to exist in the new system. Um, or Actually, it's outside the system, but the new system will be processing those, uh, those files that you're dropping off uh, on a Jscape server and then putting back the two reply files on that server. All right, Will, I'm ready to go on to slide four. Thank you. So TPAs and employers um, and unemployment filers, they're going to need new usernames and passwords in the reemployee system. Uh, so specifically for the TPAs, the username, it's kind of wide open. There's not a lot of qualifiers on that. However, the password, it's kind of, uh, you know, I'm sure you've, you folks have seen it per personally and professionally, various ways of formatting passwards. Our requirements are going to need, are going to be a uh, 
a minimum five character password. Uh, it requires at least one capital letter, one lowercase letter, um, one number and two special characters. Uh, we had a one question came up regarding uh, password and username resets. The usernames will not reset, but the passwords will reset every 365 days. So uh, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, the, again, the, uh, let's see. Well, I think we're on this wrong slide here. I think we jumped to slide five somehow. Thank you. Um, the TPA's federal identification number I mentioned earlier is the key. Uh, there's only one set of credentials for each FEIN. I uh, just want to bring to your attention for those TPAs who also happen to be Connecticut employers and are registered with the Department of Labor as an employer, uh, there's no uh, issues with the fact that your uh, employer registration number is tied to an FEIN as well as your TPA credentials. The data for TPAs and for employers are on separate tables. So that's not going to be an issue. Um, so for your own uh, corporate employee records, when you file, you could either do that as an individual employer, or you could just include it in your TPA bulk file with all your other clients' uh, tax or wage, report, uh, wage reports. Um, the, the credentials, you may establish those July 5th or later. So again, plenty of time before the July 31st filing deadline for the contributory employers. And once your credentials are established, again, you'll be able to upload uh, the, the first tax of wage reports right away after that. Um, and the, the, the process takes about maybe five minutes to establish your credentials. So uh, let's say July 5th, you have some uh, clients who just newly signed on with you and perhaps they've got a first quarter of 22 report or quarters uh, quarterly reports from 21 that need to get filed. You you don't uh, you'll be able to file those right away on July 5th. Uh, so that's some good information there. Uh, Will ready for slide five? So once you're registered in July, here's some of the changes and enhancements that you'll see uh, for your tax and wage report filing. Um, You'll no longer be FTPing files to us, which in the old days or actually currently sit on a browser and then we manually have to go and get those and run those files. Instead, you'll be uploading a, a file directly into the reemploy CT system. So you'll either be you know, doing a copy or paste or click and drag from your browser. So that's a little bit of, of a change there. Um, since it's an upload, there's no file naming convention. Whatever you've got it named in your, you know, in your own browser on your C drive or whatever, you just drag it on over. So currently we have a naming convention that requires your seven digit uh, TPA uh, account number. All of those numbers start with a, with a nine nine. Um, that's no longer required. Our current naming convention always has the quarter, also has a quarter year in there uh, that you're filing for. That's not gonna be required, but you know, just, a piece of advice personally for me, it, it probably makes sense just to have your own naming convention just so it's easier to keep track of those files. So, but we're not going to require anything specific. Um, the file is in the new ISESA format. Uh, the new file, it only contains one T record for each of your clients or each of the employers you're filing on behalf of, and then one rec, uh, S record for each of the uh, employees for that employer. So there's no longer any E or F records uh, that we're using now in the current format. When I was researching ICESA, it goes back to the 70s, that file format. And, uh, um, you know, when we were using magnetic media and uh physical media like cartridges and whatnot. And the, the, the formats were all over the place. It seemed like the only consistent thing about ASESA was that it's 276 characters long, but some entities have you know a 10 digit place to put a reg number, others have 15, 20, so it's very flexible. Uh, but uh, please check out that new format that we published. 
Um, so when the TPA signs on and tells the system who you are, there's no identifier uh, required in the file. Like in currently, uh, you're putting that seven digit number in the file. We won't need that in the T or the S record because as you sign on, that's, that's how we know who you are. And that's how we'll be naming our file when we store it uh, that, that you, uh, you sent to us. Uh, again, the prior seven digit registration number in the new system, we're calling them employer account numbers. We are in a consortium and uh, that verbiage was kind of throughout the system. So we're just adopting that. So the EANs will go from seven to 10 and for your existing clients, again, three trailing zeros. Um, for ACH debit payers, I, most of you probably pay ACH credit, but if you're paying ACH debit within the T record, there's something called a remittance authorization amount. If you're putting data in there and if you're paying an ACH debit, um, this applies to you. If you're paying ACH credit, you don't need to put anything in that field. And I'll talk, touch upon that more when I talk about the, uh, the payment methods. And then finally, um, when you're on the day you're uploading it, you're, we're only gonna give you formatting errors at a kind of at a file level. Uh, it's it, the, the files being uploaded and it's gonna be run overnight by a batch process. So at this point, only if there's major formatting errors will you get a, an error message at that time. Okay, well, I'm ready for slide six, please. So since this is an overnight batch process, uh, again, you won't get the any record level errors until the next day. So the TPAs should go in the next day and view the results of your, of your uh, file that was uploaded the previous night. Um, there's going to be two reports available there, which you could view or download. Uh, one of them is showing you the, the, uh, the count and the records which have processed successfully. Another is going to be a report showing you the rejects. Now, again, uh, you're going to hear me talk about this, I've mentioned this a couple of times. Again, please use that rate exchange because it's not just a rate exchange. It's also an EAN validation tool. So please uh, use that. Uh, to, to eliminate the amount of rejects that you're going to get. Um, also, as you'll see later, if you're paying via ACH credit, you'll just have double, double issues with the tax and wage report and then the, uh, the payment through the ACH credit. So please use that process. Um, I'll also encourage you to, to send the files early. If your clients, you know, they're their payrolls are going to be over sometime in June. Uh, for the tax and wage report, you don't need to wait to the last minute. Feel free to send those in early um, because those rejects, those need to be submitted timely also. So when those rejects get kicked out, you need to go in and research them, find the correct registration number uh, and submit those in another file, a totally separate file. Um, so again, feel free to send them early and uh, payments can still be made with the July 31st due date but uh, feel free to send in and work on these tax and wage reports as, as soon as you have data available. You don't have to wait for all your clients to, uh, uh, for all their records to be available. You can send in a partial file on July 15th and work any rejects, another one a week later, or however you want to do it, uh, file as often as you like. Okay, well, I'm ready to go on to uh, slide seven, please. Oh, you know, one, one thing I missed about the, uh, back on slide six, I'm sorry. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, regarding the, any types of corrections that need to be made, this process will only accept the uh, original tax and wage reports. It does not allow for any filing of correction returns or amendments. So there is a, uh, there are gonna be three different ways that correction returns can be submitted to the agency electronically. And uh, I, we, I'll get to that in a little bit more detail in another slide also. Thank you. Okay, well, set for so, slide seven, please. So the two electronic methods for ACH, uh, or for, for payment rather, are ACH credit and ACH debit. Um, for the ACH credit portion, uh, there is uh, some data that's going to be different in the NACHA fi file format that's sent, uh, the ACH credit format. Um, for example, like I mentioned, the, the registration numbers are 
the EANs are going from seven digits to 10, and we're no longer using your seven digit uh, TPA number beginning with the 99. Instead, we'll need the federal ID, your federal ID in there. Um, unlike the ICESA, the NACHA formats, those are kind of carved in stone. Those aren't ours. Those are you know uh, industry standard file formats provided by the banking industry. Those, those fields, descriptions, and sizes are set. So uh, there's no actual changes to the format, just some of the data in their changes. Um, the, again, this is this ACH credit format process and payment process is not linked to the tax and wage report in any way. So if you're giving us a wrong number on your tax report, and if you give us a wrong number here, that's two errors you're gonna have to fix. Um, all the banking information is the same. Uh, it's we're, we're, it's still our our bank is still Bank of America, so the information you're putting in there for your bank and for our bank is not changing. Um, again, we're no longer using that seven digit agent number, and we're not using that uh, seven digit employer account number either. Uh, so just the reminders on those. Um, any TPA who uses uh, a, a T, similar to the tax and wage report, a TPA is going to need to use their credentials to go in and see the status of the ACH credit payment that they've submitted. So similar to the tax and wage reports, you're going to see which ones have posted successfully to your clients' accounts. And you'll also be seeing the ones that uh, did not post. And you'll also need to, to come back in and fix those yourselves. Um, 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 meeting with the uh, our system vendor next week, along with our bank, with Bank of America representatives, and we're going to discuss a, a test plan for this, especially for uh, new TPAs and TPAs who represent just reimbursable employers. They've never been able to pay electronically, so this will be completely new to those types of uh, representatives. So, uh, again, it, uh, it, we're going to, uh, after that meeting, we're going to have more information available for you about the ACH credit process. And uh, the payments aren't due to July 31st, so we've, we've got more time than just that July 5th deadline to, to get this straight out, but more information will be coming uh, out shortly. Regarding the ACH payment method, there's a little change here. Um, as I mentioned in the tax and wage report file in that T record, there's a place where you could put a remittance amount. If you're paying ACH debit and uh, you'll, well not and, if you're paying ACH debit, you're gonna need to put an amount in that field. The system is going to sum up those amounts. And when you come back in after uploading the file, you'll be able to see the summation of all those remittance amounts and authorize us to take up to that amount out of your account via the ACH debit process. Uh, here's one difference from the old way and the new way. Let's say you sent us a record with 10 employers and they each had a remittance amount of $100. And after you upload the file, you come back in, you look at our ACH debit screens and it shows you a $1,000 authorization amount for the 10, 10 uh, employers times the $100 each. If eight of those records posted and two of them rejected for you to fix and resubmit a file uh, um, on behalf of those two employers, uh, we're only going to take the $800 out of your account uh, and that's uh, and apply that to the uh, employers whose records have posted successfully. So that's why you need to come in and take a look at that. And then uh, for those other two, once you have their information correct and submit another tax and wage report, you go through the ACH process and pay us that other 200 at that time. So that's a bit of a, a difference now. Uh, right now, if you send us a bad registration number, we're putting in a holding account and uh, we're swamped and we, we attempt to find the correct registration number and transfer the money. But there's a lot of these, a lot of your agent accounts starting with the 99 still have funds in them because we just haven't been able to do that. Uh, because we didn't, we haven't had enough information to do it with. Um, all right, well, I'm ready for slide eight, please. So I mentioned uh, the corrections uh, earlier. Here's a little more information. So after July 5th, again, we're going to be fully digital and uh, employers or their agents will be able to uh, make correction returns electronically. So we'll no longer be processing hard copies of correction returns. Uh, per statute, your clients are uh, required to uh, file correctly uh, by the due date. So uh, yeah, we encourage TPAs to take a look at their business models or 
talk to their clients, figure out, you know, if, if you have a lot of corrections, we encourage you to figure out why is it happening. Um, and on any given quarter, we're giving uh, you at least 30 days from the end of that last payroll, the end of the quarter, the calendar quarter. Uh, and for the first quarter, for example, it's April 30th. All the other quarters are the 31st. So we're giving you 30 to 31 days. If, you're the, if your client's last payroll was December 18th, that's another 13 days on top of it until the July 31st due date. If, if it's a weekend on July 31st, you're getting, I'm sorry, January 31st, you're getting another day or two. So there's times where you've got 45, 46, 47 days uh, to get the information correct and submitted uh, accurately the first time, the original time by the due date. So please do that uh, and really cut down on, on, uh, on the errors and corrections and amendments. Um, the three ways that they can be corrected, you know, I, there's still going to be some, despite the use of the rate exchange and information process, there'll still be some corrections. So there's three ways that those can be taken care of and fixed. Um, your employers, uh, your clients who are the employers, they'll be able to do it themselves if that's how you want to handle it. Um, it employers will be able to go on July 5th and thereafter and establish their own credentials and have uh, access to our system. Not only will they be able to do the uh, corrections, but they're going to be able to give us a, a and we're going to encourage them also to give us a lot more information than we currently have now. For example, right now we only have one address of record. We'll be able to have uh, four in the new system. It accommodates four different ones. Um, the four are for uh, tax, uh, tax uh, payment, uh, tax related uh, correspondence going out would go to that address. There's a claimant correspondence that would go out uh, to a claim address. There's a uh, tax preparer, like if you have a, an accountant or if your clients have an accountant or yourselves, they could put that your addresses in there. And then finally, the fourth address is the physical address uh, uh, of uh, the employer in Connecticut. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, also, they can set up sub users, and if they choose to, they can uh, create a sub user account for you. Uh, but typically, what the sub user is used for, whoever goes in the first time for that employer and sets up credentials, those are kind of the master user accounts or uh, credentials. Um, they can then say they had their an HR department or some uh, clerical staff who they wanted to give certain rights and access to they can establish a, a username and password for those sub users. So going down to that third sub bullet, that kind of, I kind of spoke to that already. That's where the employers can set you up as a sub user. And if you, uh, it, once they gave you their, their sub user credentials, you can go in uh, as the employer themselves and make the corrections yourself. The probably more common way that it's going to be done is the middle bullet there, the middle sub bullet. Um, TPAs can be linked to their clients, and the way we're going to do that initially is um, we're going to publish a uh, Excel spreadsheet, and I believe there's uh, four columns on there where you give us your client's EAN, your client's federal ID number, and their name, and I forget what the fourth column is, but uh, we'll, we'll publish that soon, and once we get that from you, we're going to compare the EAN to the FAN, make sure it's a correct number uh, that exists in the account in our database accounts uh, list of accounts and that uh, not only that it exists but it matches the FEIN and that the numbers are active and liable um, and then we're also going to double check and see that we have a power of attorney or memorandum of understanding with with you the TPA uh, which in Connecticut they our memorandums kind of blanketly say that if you're filing on somebody's behalf, you have the legal uh, authorization to do so. In our other two states, they're requiring the employers to send those in one by one, and then their staff does the linking one by one. <clears throat> so uh, because they don't have the, the blanket memorandum kind of a feature. So that's something we'll be doing uh, to kind of make this more uh, more efficient for, for you folks. Um, that won't need to be done until July 5th because we can't link them to you until you are actually in the system and credentialed. So uh, you can start sending those into us uh, at that time. If you want to start compiling that data now, feel free. Um, again, I'm pretty sure we've got that out there. That form is out there. And if not, we will get it out there shortly. Okay, Will, I'm all set for slide nine, please. 
Okay, so um, I've said it a lot of times, I promise I won't talk about it again today unless I'm asked about it. But uh, again, please, it's imperative that you use that uh, rate exchange process. Um, it, it's really going to help you cut down on the amount of uh, rejects and errors that you're going to have to deal with or that your clients are going to have to deal with. Um, it'll allow you to make sure, not only make sure you have the correct rate, but it validates whether that employer account number is, uh, is an active and valid number and tied to the federal identification number of your, your client. Okay, Will, slide 10, please. So uh, this is the last slide, and I uh, just want to kind of mention a couple of things about our ongoing communication efforts, which include uh, being able to email us questions and concerns at the uh, at these, uh, address there, ctdoltaxinfo at ct.gov. Um, we also have the following website resources available. Uh, the reemployee CT uh, information will be at www.ctdol.state.ct.us. Uh, frequently asked questions are, 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 uh, are there and they're updated regularly. Uh, you can also sign up uh, for the reemployee at the, for the reemployee CT email updates. And uh, if you do that, you'll be able to keep an eye out for our uh, webinar in June, as well as other uh, information we'll be sending you sending out to you. So again, we urge TPAs and employers to sign up for all of these various things. Uh, we're not we won't use these any of these lists for anything beyond the reemploy uh, information system and you know get, getting information out to you. Uh, we just want to make sure that we can notify you of website updates and screen screenshot sneak peeks as we start publishing those. Uh, so this concludes my portion of the PowerPoint presentation. Now I'll kick it back to Juliet. Thanks, Henry. Appreciate that. Uh, so at this time, we'd like to open the floor to questions. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, just remember to unmute yourself before you start to speak. Um, if you have a short question, you can drop it in the chat as well. Uh, Michaela, do we have any questions in the chat? Yes, we have one from Kayla Santos, and I'm going to go ahead and read it as it's a short question. And she's just asking for reimbursed clients. They will be able to be in this new file format, correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And although they technically don't have a tax report since they're reimbursable and not taxable, still within the T record are a couple of things they need to give us. The uh, the summation of the total wages will need to go there, and the uh, the count of employees, the three monthly counts, I believe, um, are the Bureau of Labor Statistics refers to it as employees who were employed on the 12th of the month uh, within the payroll period that included the 12th of that month. So those three employee counts would also need to be in the T record. Great. Thank you. And we have a question from Lindsay. Lindsay, would you unmute yourself? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I'm actually calling, or I'm sorry, I'm questioning the ACH credit process. You had mentioned that um, when the payment is remitted, that we need to go online the next day and make sure that it's posted. Um, since the ACH credit payment is an automatic payment that's sent, I'm wondering if there's an issue how we would get it posted where it needs to be, unlike ACH debit, where we know if the return is rejected, that payment is also rejected and we can just remit the payment with the return at that time, but with ACH credit being submitted separately from the return, uh, what's your advice on how to correct it? Okay, so basically the, uh, the entire amount of the deposit is going to get deposited to our bank. Uh, but within that overall deposit are gonna be multiple employer records and sub payments, you know, all those smaller payments broken down that need to go to each employer. So the ones that, are submitted correctly will get posted to those employers, your clients. The ones that don't, you'll need to go in and use your TPA credentials and you'll be able, again, once the screenshots are available, it'll, it'll make more sense and be clearer. But there'll be an opportunity for you to view the, uh, the status of that ACH credit payment and you'll be able to see which records had kicked out. And that's where you'll be able to do some offline research and come in and then 
uh, change whatever information needs to be changed to get that posted. For example, if it's a wrong registration number, you can go in and correct that. If it's uh, because the employee, your client it was terminated or discontinued in the past and is back in business but hasn't told us and the account's not open, then somebody will need to work with our employer status unit to reactivate that number or issue a new one if it's been closed out for too long. Uh, but either way, uh, the, the TPA will need to fix those records that had uh, for the, uh, the portion of the ACH credit deposit that had not posted. Got it. Okay, so rather than the payment getting sent back to our bank account, it kind of goes into this holding account and we'll know which payments are affected and then from there we can correct them to ensure they get to the right account. Yes, exactly, Lindsay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so Billy put a question in the chat. Um, Billy, would you like to unmute yourself? Sure, thank you. Uh, so my question is regarding the actual quarterly uh, wage submission. So just to confirm, we currently use uh, submit all of our quarterly filings automatically via FSET. Just to confirm, like we, we're no longer going to be able to do so. Like all TPAs are required to use this manual upload process through the new system. Uh, no, actually, the FSET process is totally separate. It will continue, and there's there'll be information coming out. Uh, on that also. Um, right now, we only have, I think, four or five FSET vendors who we're dealing with. So are when you're saying that you do it, are, are you an employer who uses the FSET process? Or are you a TPA who uses one of those five vendors uh, software to process returns to your clients? Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm with a TPA Square Payroll, and okay. we use FSET to submit on behalf of our clients. Okay, so they're using your software product. You're compiling the information daily and sending us the FSET files, right? Correct. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, perhaps somebody else in the agency has heard, but we've kind of reached out to the the TPA. Uh, I'm sorry, to the FSET vendors who are currently uh, filing with us, and uh, th that is a separate process than this, but that will continue. And there are some changes within, uh, again, FSET is kind of like ACH credit. That's a carved in stone uh, file format. And you know you have the withholding record, you have the state UI record within there. We can't change that around. You know maybe some of the data will be a little different, um, but yeah, that there's more information out there. Um, one thing I'll mention is in the past we were kind of the gatekeeper of that. We would receive both the state UI unemployment insurance record and the state withholding record, and then um, systematically, programmatically, we'd get the withholding information all over to the Department of Revenue Services, but going forward that we're gonna be separate from Department of Revenue Services. You'll just be sending us state UI records and revenue, I'm not sure Revenue Services might have already uh, kind of weaned themselves off of our interface, but uh, if not, that'll be happening before July 5th. Yep, the, the Connecticut DRS actually made that change effective for Q4 2021 filings. So right. we actually went from this combined FSET submission to a manual upload through the DR. They have their own like website now, yep. essentially specifically for withholding. I'm just a little confused then. Like, uh, so would we expect then like none of the file format or anything to change that we currently submit through the FSET? And like, if so, is there going to be any type of announcement made in, in terms of like how this change will impact us? Yeah, like I said, some information went on already. I'm, I could uh, perhaps uh, link up with you somehow a little later and get you know, get some more information and find out who we might have contacted within within your company. But uh, for example, uh, our current format that's being used now it's really old we're using very old versions uh something like 1.5 2.0 and 2.1 i think uh, but a lot of times there's there's rarely changes within the uh the state unemployment file anyways usually it's at the uh, irs or drs level where there's often changes but we're uh we're going up to 5.4 is one of the changes uh and again between the um no longer having that nine nine number and no longer having a seven digit uh, registration number for the employers. There are some changes to the data, and, but we, we can't change the file formats in any way. So we're using that 5.4 version. Got it. Thank you very much. Okay. And Michelle asked, could you send us the link for the Excel format to link clients and TPAs? Sure. Um, 
Let's see, uh, Julia, any idea what the best way to get that information over to us? Should it be through the, uh, the email address provided? Yeah, if you uh, would just send us the file and then we can be the go-between to make sure we get it out to the TPAs. Okay. I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, Lewis has a question. Lewis, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, hello. Um, I'm calling uh, on behalf of a TPA. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if we needed that individual access to our employer accounts to be able to process the corrections or amendments. Yes, you would. Uh, okay. Yes, if you were going to do that for them, uh, you would need to either be linked to that to those clients, which again, we can help you with uh, from July 5th on, or the client would need to give you a sub user account and you'd pretty much go in just as your any employer could go into their account. Okay. And just uh, as a follow up question to that is this whole process of getting, you know, you guys sending us that Excel um, to, to link our accounts, can that be done prior to that July 5th date or is that going to have to happen after the July 5th date? You can get the file, uh, the list going, that Excel spreadsheet. You can start populating that and doing your research and you know getting your client names and information on there. But until you establish your credentials on or after July 5th, we won't actually be able to do the upload. Um, so I would suggest you just, just hang on to that Excel spreadsheet, uh, especially if perhaps you're getting new clients or clients are dropping off. Uh, you know, no, no reason to update it now in May when we, uh, so. I, yeah, I'd suggest you hold off on uh, actually sending it to us until at the, uh, you know, as late as possible or as close as possible to July 5th. Okay. And you guys have a minimum threshold for the amount of clients or a maximum threshold? No. no. All no. right. Perfect. Yeah. Some of the larger TPAs have upwards of 19,000 clients. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering my questions. No problem. Are there any other questions? We don't have any hands up. Uh, anything in the chat, Michaela? Uh, nothing in the chat. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate this. Uh, Commissioner Bartolomeo, would you like to close, close us out? Yeah, thank you. So um, I just want to say thank you to Juliet and the comms team. Thank you to um, Mike Lucente, our tax director and expert Henry Piancos. Um, I, I think that you all can see how this has been um, a massive effort and we are so excited. We really do hope that this ends up making your lives easier as well as ours, as well as claimants. Um, think of us on your July 4th weekend. We'll be getting ready to launch on the 5th. And uh, please do remember to sign up for the email updates. Let us know if you have questions and hopefully you found this helpful as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Henry, Mike, would you like to say goodbye? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for attending and uh, we look forward to working with you on, in the new system. Yeah, thank you all. And um, I believe Michaela put in the chat the email address that's currently on the um, system uh, on the page. If, so if you have any questions, you know, send them to that email address and uh, we will get back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. And I'll...